It is a gift to be sitting here today with Nancy French. So I'll just begin by saying thank you so much for joining me. I'm so glad to be here. It's so great to see you and talk to you. I know. We were um, reminiscing as we, before this started, that we think the last time we talked might have been 10 or more years ago. So I'm <laughs> glad to talk with you again. And we're here today because you've written a new memoir and it's called Ghosted, an American Story. I thought maybe one way of introducing you and your story uh, to listeners uh, of this podcast, you could start with the title of the book, Why Ghosted? Okay. So some of you may know that celebrity books are not typically written by celebrities. Um, this is mostly true. There is There are occasionally celebrities who have the ability, time, and bandwidth to create their own books, but most people are hired. Uh, they usually hire people like me, unknown, obscure writers across the country to help them ghostwrite their books. So I've been a ghostwriter for several years, but the title really is a pun on being isolated and rejected by your community, you know, mm -hmm. like when you're ghosted by by people or boyfriends or, or friends. Um, so it's sort of like a, a, a pun on the fact that I'm a ghostwriter and that in the past few years, uh, several uh, groups of people that I thought should have embraced me have rejected me. So that sounds yeah. fun. I'll, <laughs> I'll kind of follow up on what you said there, both to underscore What's really fascinating about this book is that the fact that you've been a ghostwriter is really clear in just how readable it is. Like, it's mm -hmm. like, it's a very engaging, engrossing, like what happens next story of your life. Um, and then also the number of the different facets of exactly what you described in terms of being ghosted. Um, I'm not sure you ever even use that phrase in the book. It's just this kind of title that hangs over these experiences um, throughout the book that, yeah, it really does hold both of those things together for sure. Um, will you, I guess we're going to hopefully get into some of those things, but I thought maybe we'd start with the political piece of it. Uh, there's, they're all intertwined. There's kind of politics and faith and then your particular experience as a woman as well. And I'd like to talk about all of those things, but I thought maybe we'd start with politics. There's a Quotation about halfway through the book, you wrote, I will, I would not bear false witness against my liberal neighbor. That one decision was the beginning of the end of my political ghostwriting career. I'm sure for <laughs> listeners, they might need some context. So context for like, what does it mean to bear false witness? Why would you be talking about doing that against a liberal neighbor? But, but also like, what, why was that the beginning of the end of a ghostwriting career? Well, I sort of got into a vein of writing gigs where I was writing for GOP politicians and I worked for, I lived with Sarah Palin in her Wasilla house. I worked with Bristol Palin. I worked with uh, Ben Sass and Mrs. Uh, Ann Romney and a governor, you know, senators. I, like I've worked with a bunch of people and um, those people have different needs because they have different brands, they have different vibes. And so, but my spiritual gift that is not listed in first Corinthians is owning the libs. And so <laughs> for a long time, I specialized in like, you know, making the audience drink liberal tears or whatever. So like I'd go to Fox news and I'd sit off, off outside the camera and I would feed lines to my clients. And I was just generally acrimonious mm. um, because that was the gig. Like this was back you know, several years ago, this was pre-Trump, uh, pre-Trump's dominance. Of course, I watched Celebrity Apprentice. Um, but uh, I thought that political acrimony was just part of it. It was sort mm -hmm. of like wink, wink. You know, like I grew up with Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill sort of going at each other during the day, but being kind to each other in the night. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was sort of like rhetorical pugilism that was acceptable. And then I realized that things, people were serious. Like we weren't just kidding. We weren't just uh, making barbs at each other during the day. We actually hated each other. Mm -hmm. And I was part of the problem. Um, and so when I realized that, I was like, oh, I am causing some of this acrimony at least. And so I sort of decided that I wanted to refigure my entire career. Um, mm -hmm. One of the things that I decided not to do is to not bear false witness against my neighbor. Um, and that sounds like a pretty easy thing to do, except that 
there's this whole way of interacting in punditry, which is called nut picking, where you pick the crazy person in Madison, Wisconsin, who may have done something crazy. And then you elevate that into an article and you say, this is how liberals are Mm -hmm. when it's not true. You know, like you, this happens to Christians all the time and to conservatives all the time where you pick some, you know, strange thing that happened in Kansas and say conservatives hate this or whatever. Yeah. And so, you know, it's just sort of like, it's the golden rule, but it actually um, had a profound impact on what I could write. Um, because I just wanted to be fair. I didn't want to score a political point. I wanted to be truthful. And that sort of ruined my occupational <laughs> options. <laughs> I was unemployed basically for a long time. Yeah. I mean, which is a sad commentary, right? On um, our political scene. Uh, and I'm curious, was that a dawning realization over time? Or was there like a defining moment, like a line in the sand experience? Well, Yeah. So I had written for GOP politicians forever and I knew exactly what they wanted me to say because we were aligned. I knew. So they would call me and they'd say, I need an immigration article. I wouldn't say, what do you think about this topic? I would know what they would think. Mm -hmm. Then when Donald Trump made that comment about uh, John McCain and how he prefers his heroes not to be captured, I was standing at church and I was so shocked Yeah, because Every client that I've ever had in the history of my life would have said, oh, my gosh, we conservatives support the military. We're patriotic. We appreciate courage. But then all of my clients or some of my clients were laughing at that. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wait a minute. I think we don't mock prisoners of war. I think that's generally I think that's what our MO is on this. But I was wrong because they wanted to do that. And I was like, "Okay, this is a. Suddenly there's a chasm between me and my clients Mm. and I don't know if I can traverse it, but I tried, I tried for a long time. Yeah. Um, And eventually I found myself at a MAGA rally writing for a client that was introducing uh, the future president. And I was there and they were like, Hey, come get a picture with Donald Trump and you can show it to your grandchildren later. And I just had that moment of um, like panic because I, I was thinking, what would my grandchildren think about mm. me being here? I don't want to immortalize this. Um, so I politely refused the photograph and decided to get out of this geographically and occupationally. Yeah, which, you know, was no low cost for you, as you just mentioned, like to be like, I'm essentially going to tank my career by... Um, not even like standing up for what I believe, but by refusing to stand up for what I don't believe. <laughs> like that's, you yeah. know, um, and, I, and, I, and you've mentioned this already, but this isn't just a story of politics. It's also a story about the church. So those things have been intertwined, obviously for many, many years, not just in recent years in American politics and political and religious life. But I'd love to hear a little bit about that. I thought maybe we could start by just getting a sense of your religious background. So not the current day, but just, you know, what, what, because you, it was a little tumultuous um, from the get go. So I'm curious if you could just tell us about your kind of faith and spiritual background as a child and adolescent. Yeah, so I grew up in rural in the rural South, and I attended a denomination called the Church of Christ. And if you're a Church of Christ, you're already mad at me because I called it a denomina- denomination. Um, the Can you Church explain Christ, what, like why would yeah. that be maddening? <laughs> yeah, they believe that they're the true tr- the true New Testament Church, and so mm-hmm. everything else is a denomination. It's out of the main. Um, But they're the true New Testament church. But it was, you know, just small town by the lake church, went four times, three times a week, stayed until the, you know, deacons turned out the lights, just very sweet, fundamentalist, um, you know, community. And Mm -hmm. I loved it. I love church so much. My problem uh, came when I was uh, abused by my vacation Bible school teacher, um, like when I was about 12. And that sort of messed things up as you might imagine. And it sort of made me start being confused and having to hide things and be more duplicitous. So it sort of put space between me and the church, me and God in a way that was very difficult to traverse. Yeah. And that abuse went on for years. That was not like an isolated incident. Um, And I don't know if that, you know, there's no gradation of better or worse in terms of that type of experience, but um, I, it's, from reading your book, there was this ongoing 
sense of confusion of like what's happening on Sunday morning and what's happening in, you know, with this guy during the week. Um, how do they, what does this mean about who I am? What does this mean about who God is? Like uh, questions that maybe you'd be asking as an adolescent anyway, but I, it seems as though those got even more confused. Yeah, even more confused. And unfortunately, the church stepped in and answered those questions um, because they would come in and they would say, well, w- w- young ladies, you are responsible for your sexuality. Mm. You have to have all these safeguards. You have to be modest. If you, um, if anyone is showing you undue attention, it's because you wanted it. Um, once you are damaged by society or men, you're damaged forever. Mm-hmm. There's no, you know, it's like the opposite of, the gospel, which is forgiveness and grace and restoration and all things are made new. But for some reason in this, in my community, it was like the sexual purity once violated was uh, you can't go back. Mm. And so once I was ruined at age 12, you can imagine it was a pretty (laughs) desperate feeling. But over the past few years, you know, it, it takes a long time for victims of child sex abuse to sort of process it. So I'm sort of still doing that. Yeah, totally. And I mean, and I guess, and that's probably a part of the trauma of it is the silence, right? And the, and the mixed messages, especially when you're that young and being told implicitly, this was your fault. Um, Yeah. And I guess in reading your book, I did feel like over and over again, not just in that area, although certainly there, the church really failed you. And then you watched as an adult, as the church failed other women, like failed to believe other women, um, sometimes by mocking their stories. I'm thinking, um, yeah, of some, you gave some examples and other times of just ignoring or, um, you know, just denying, dismissing. And I'm just curious for you, like, how did that silence or dismissal affect your faith? Like how, for you personally, how have you carried on as a Christian? Well, you know, it's interesting. I've, I've, I'm just sort of becoming alert to all of this. I think I've sort of been in a zombie like state as it pertains Mm. to sexual abuse. Um, I never talked about it. I never dealt with it until 2016 when I wrote an article in the Washington post talking about this vacation Bible school teacher. Um, and, then publishers came to me and asked me to write books. And Amy, Julia, you'll appreciate this. You know how hard it is to get anybody to read anything that you write. And I was sort of unemployed because I had quit my ghostwriting. But I, I wasn't able to write about that because mm. I didn't feel like a, an expert. I felt like someone who got it completely wrong. Mm. <clears throat> so I couldn't imagine going into a church and saying, let me, exp-, you know, going into a church period to talk about this. So it was very uh, disconcerting, but, but I, I, so I feel like I didn't have a moment where I completely rejected Christianity, except in college, you know, when I was sort of trying to figure that out. And, um, I just, I've always felt close to God. I always felt like I trusted God, um, in spite of the church sometimes letting me down in such profound ways and not just women, but, uh, boys, you know, like I, I'm an investigative journalist lately. And for the past three years, I've invested, investigated this camp in Missouri called Canacock and hundreds of boys were abused. And I thought after working for three years on this investigation, I would announce it to the church and everyone would be shocked. And it'd be this huge bombshell that this evangelical institution was so corrupt with pedophilia but the church had this collective yawn. So Mm. when I wrote in 2016, this Washington post piece and people responded sort of negatively because they thought I was using my own sex abuse against Donald Trump and allowing it to sort of pervert my, uh, political opinion. Um, then I did this Canacock investigation and the church was like, Oh, so you've established all of these pedophiles are real, but what about Pizzagate? What about Joe Biden's creepy hugs? You know, and I was just like, okay, y'all are going to have to give me some space. (laughs) Right. (laughs) right. I can't deal with this. So I'm sort of clinging to Christianity with my fingernails, but I'm, I feel like a God, I have a vice grip on God and he has a vice grip on me, but everything else is sort of up in the air. Mm. Which is so tragic. Um, and I I do wonder if you have any thoughts and you might not yet because that 
I mean, you did pretty much single-handedly expose a tremendous abuse scandal and cover up by one of these like preeminent Christian camps. Um, and, and just state stating that sentence is like shocking in and of itself. A- again, especially with your description of a collective yawn that like, yeah. that, um, and I don't understand why there has not been a collective horror reckoning, you know, um, et cetera. But I, I guess I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on that. Like, what would it take for the church? And I know I'm speaking in broad terms, but to uh, when these types of things come up to really admit wrongdoing and really reckon with it. So when I was investigating Canacock in Missouri, I knew I was going into a very red area politically. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so I would talk to them in the following ways. I would say, look, I believe that Bill Clinton is a rapist. I also believe that Pete Newman, the counselor at Canacut Camps, is a rapist. Mm-hmm. And that Joe White, the CEO of Canacut Camps, is allowing, you know, like, is not allowing, but is like aware of it and is covering it up and is lying about it. You know, so like you can believe two things at the same time. Mm-hmm. You can believe that Harvey Weinstein and Donald Trump have sexual predation issues. At yeah. the same time, you can also walk and chew gum. It's amazing when you can embrace the power of both and. Um, and so what happens is these, I, we do it, I do it, I've done it my whole life probably until recently, where you just, you err on the side of protecting your tribe. Mm-hmm. So in 98, when the Southern Baptists put out their proclamation about the importance of moral character and presidents, we know who was president in 98. The Southern Baptists aren't putting out those proclamations now. Right. But you can be morally consistent. And it's pretty easy in the case of rape and pedophiles to draw a line. Right. But people won't. I, I'm so gobsmacked. I'm perplexed. But it has something to do with, yeah, I believe the Catholics have a sex abuse problem, but not Canacut camps because Joe White is SBC. Mm-hmm. And I'm curious, backing up a minute, so in... 2016, you wrote an article for the Washington Post. Uh, and this is before the Canacuck stuff, but they're somewhat related to each other. And you mentioned it. It was called What It's Like to Experience the 2016 Election as Both a Conservative and a Sex Abuse Survivor. So there you go with your both and, right? Um, right. Which we know, statistically speaking, you are not alone as that both and, right? As both a conservative and a sex abuse survivor. Um, obviously, the attention that article garnered even also speaks to the fact that there's some number of people who are like, yes, let's talk about this. Um, and yet there's also some, I guess, repression or just a like, I don't want to touch that. And I think, as you said, there's like a tribalism that comes in. But why do we have such a hard time putting uh, those things in a box together? I have no idea. I mean, it's just, it's, I think it's so like self, um, like if you have this box of stuff, that's your stuff and it's a red box or a blue box, depending on your political ideology, Mm -hmm. you have it and you want everything in there to be good because you don't want to be like team lesser evil. You want your box to have so much goodness in it. And so when someone tries to put something in your box that makes you feel iffy or yucky, you're just like, nope, I don't believe it. You're you're a part of cancel culture. Mm-hmm. The number of times that people have said that I'm trying to cancel anything, which I've never tried to cancel anything. I'm just literally trying to uncover the truth. Uh, it's just, it's just shocking. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and you've seen that on both sides of the political aisle, right? In terms of attitude, callous attitudes towards women. Um, yes. and I feel like it might be worth like sharing a little bit of the Bristol Palin story in the, the midst of that, because on the one hand, you're being told, by all of these conservative Republicans, like there's no there there, whether that is your own personal story of sexual abuse or uh, the stories from Canacuck. But then you're also seeing this happen in a more like, you know, progressive slash liberal space. Well, right. And I grew up as a rural Tennessee Republican. Ted Kennedy, two words. You can't say anything if you say Ted Kennedy, everything comes to you, if you're Gen X, um, that this man who is the patriarch of the Democratic Party literally allowed a person to die. I don't think he killed Mary Jo Kopechnik or, you know, I don't think that, it, but it was like weird. And also he was lecherous. Yeah. Bill Clinton 
has several credible rape allegations against him. And the Democrats were like, hey, these are our people. Now, Bill Clinton is is also the pater familias of the party now, you know, Mm -hmm. and it's like, okay, guys, can we just relax a second and just actually assess this? But for very many years, no one assessed that. I don't even think it's controversial to say these things now. But in the 90s, I mean, people would sacrifice you for even having that sort of accusation. So I grew up my whole life believing that liberal men were libertine sexual predators, mm-hmm. or at least liberal men were chill with that. And I was right. Um, so to see the cultural shift, I'm so shocked because I thought our party was, I thought my party, which was the GOP at the time, we were the party of family values. I don't know if y'all remember Dan Quill and Murphy Brown and all that, but they said those words and I believed them. Um, but I'm anyway, it's, it's been very jolting to see the transition. But I went for my first book when I was ghostwriting, the first one that actually was published. And I went to Wasilla and met Bristol Palin. And her story is one that you guys know or you think you know. Hmm. Um, she, as she was pregnant uh, during the campaign and it, uh, when Sarah Palin, Palin was nominated for the GOP nomination. And it was embarrassing. And she was a a teenager. And when I got to Wasilla and I talked to her, her story was less like devil may care attitude about this situation. It was a little bit, uh, the way she described it seemed more reminiscent of abuse than, uh, and lack of consent and everything that goes along with that. I don't want to characterize her story for her, but we wrote it in the book. So the very first line of the sentence was, I lied to my mother and she goes to uh, have like a, a, she was said she was going to a friend's house. She went uh, and was hanging out with other people. But the, she said that her, she didn't lose her virginity, but it was stolen. And that's yeah. a different thing. And so when I thought when that was published that people would care, mm-hmm. especially because democratic women were starting to speak up and starting to, you know, talk more about abuse. And I thought they would look at Bristol Palin and say, oh my gosh, we got this story wrong. So sorry for all the condemnation and the contempt, which by the way, shouldn't have existed anyway. Right. But um, anyway, but that's not what happened. People were like, I don't believe Bristol. She's just trying to get attention. She's, you know, it it was, it was very demoralizing, but I left Wasilla in that book launch um, feeling like, okay, Democrats don't actually care about women. They only care about women who are liberal and I'm not one of those people. So they mm-hmm. don't like me. So it's like, I never quite had a tribe. Um, and I still don't. Do you think those experiences have helped you actually to have more of the both and like to not live in, to break out of some of the boxes that we tend to put people into? Yeah, maybe I, that's a positive way of putting it. I'm, I might, <laughs> might have devolved into neither, neither nor or something, but <laughs> okay. I don't know. Fair enough. Yeah. Well, and I guess I'm wondering, all right, I have a follow-up question that I'm now forgetting. <laughs> so, um, oh, I know. I just was going to, I wanted to ask like what, so how did the Me Too movement um, affect you? Like, can you just give us your kind of take on that in light of all of these, again, divergent experiences, both politically, church, woman, like, yeah, what do you make of the Me Too movement? Yeah, well, I was terrified to see it. I I felt trepidation and dread. And I think it's because I wrote the 2016 Washington Post piece just right before this dawned. And I had gotten obliterated and eviscerated Mm. and put on a skillet for that 2016 Washington Post piece. The conservative pundits came out of the woodwork to mock me, Um, even though it was the victim of a pedophile. They said I seduced my pastor. Oh, the people would put stuff online of me. Let's just clarify for a moment. You were 12 and he was? Uh, 22 or 23. Okay. Just want to like, for the record, since people who haven't read the book, wouldn't know that detail. Right. And somehow yeah. you were being called to uh, blame for that. Keep going. Yeah. It's so, I never in a million years thought that if I revealed the secret that I'd kept my whole life, that conservative pundits with editors 
would write sentences like they did. Yeah. Um, so yeah. And so for a long time, I was sort of harassed. I mean, still to this day, if I log on to X, formerly Twitter, people will make comments to me or they created like fake pornographic videos of me. I just awful stuff. And yeah. then there was also all this racism in there too. You know, we, so when I saw the Me Too movement, I was like, ladies and gentlemen, y'all need to back up. This is horrifying. Don't do it. Uh, but I was actually very gratified to see mm. that the cultural shift happened. And I do think that the cultural shift has been significant. Like all of the stuff that I was saying about the democratic men that I, the leaders that I grew up sort of feeling creeped out by. Um, I do feel like this shift has occurred, not yeah. incredibly. I mean, if it had, you know, Hillary Clinton mocking sexual abuse victims like Paula Jones and others like that should no woman should take that. Right. Yeah. That's why Hillary Clinton was not acceptable to me, not uh, amongst many other reasons, but neither was Donald Trump. Right. So I, I'm finding myself in this place where I'm just so politically homeless mm -hmm. and isolated and lonely. And I just feel like a bunch of us feel that way. Yeah. So my book is sort of like extending my hand and saying, hey, guys, let's hang out. <laughs> right, right. Well, and let's speak to that for a minute. Back, you describe an award that your husband, who we haven't mentioned yet. So David French, some people will be familiar with his name also, because he is now a regular columnist for the New York Times, but has also been a writer and a political commentator for many, many years. Um, and he, in 2012, I believe, received a really high, like an award by the Republican Party. Can you describe like that experience and then what came on the heels of it uh, for you both? Yeah. So we, my husband and I, at one point, were like Republican royalty. So David went to a Christian, a Christian college, went to Harvard Law School, became a constitutional attorney, joined the army after 9-11, was deployed, earned a Bronze Star, has offered pro-life legal counsel for free, represented student groups, uh, Christian student groups for free. I mean, just, he's a freaking beast. He's amazing. So smart. <laughs> um, and then I, on the other hand, would write books for celebrity GOP politicians. So on one day in 2012, I was filming a reality TV show with Bristol Palin and David, and that night, David received the uh, CPAC's Ronald Reagan Award. And so the whole, it was like this big, surprise and it was being filmed and um you know being broadcast on c-span for all the 11 uh watchers out there in america <laughs> and uh you know we got a standing ovation and cpac leader al cardenas who's amazing was like this is the man he represents all the values that we care about and mm -hmm. david talked about taking care of the fatherless and uh defending the uh, people who are weak and strong military and family, you know, all this stuff. And we got the standing ovation and we waved. And anyway, that was the last time that we were ever even invited back because that's when the shift started happening. And now I'm sure, you know, if you go to CPAC, they might have like an effigy of David hanging in the corner or something. I'm not sure. <laughs> but yeah, it was, it was the most, I, I call that the most 24 hour, the most Republican 24 hours of my life. And probably the last. Right, exactly. Um, well, and I guess I think it's worth you've mentioned some of these things, but I do think it's worth asking, like, you both, I mean, would you say, sorry, let me put back up. After that, would you say the break with the Republican Party had to do with both of you saying, I not only cannot support Donald Trump, but actually would be, you know, actively against his candidacy? Yeah, I mean, so when I and I keep talking about this McCain thing, but like mocking someone for being a prisoner of war mm -hmm. is about the worst thing I've ever heard in my life. My dad joined the Marines when he was 15. David joined the Army after 9-11. My son, yeah. my son-in-law is joining the Marines. My son is thinking about joining the something. <laughs> I could not in good conscience in my for the rest of my life support someone who makes fun of prisoners of war, let alone disabled people, let alone black people, yeah. let alone immigrants, let right. alone women. I mean, it's like the list is so long. Mm -hmm. You just can't do it. It's like I went to that uh, church in by the lake my whole life and every single youth group was 
when they pass you the red solo cup, you do not take a drink. And I felt like the culture was passing me this red solo hat, make America great again hat. And I was like, uh, I think this is not what you're supposed to do. I don't think you're supposed to make fun of disabled people. I don't think you're supposed to make fun of immigrants. I don't think you're supposed to rate people casually. I mean, you know, like I, it's, it's so, it's, it feels so stupid even saying it because it seems so obvious, but right. I know that there are people who were subscribing to the lesser of two evils, you know, they, people made different choices and I get it, but, um, I just didn't feel like I could. Yeah. And what did it, what did it cost you both? You write about this in the book for sure. But, um, what, if, what is, what is the cost been? And do you feel as though there's been any gain? Uh, well, the cost was pretty significant because once you speak out against Donald Trump, your persona non grata, you're about as popular as head lice in America right now, or at least in, in this party. Um, and, and we live in rural Tennessee, so it's not like we're hanging out in New York and going to cocktail parties in DC Beltway. We, we're everybody that we know is conservative. Um, all of my family members, I love everybody down here. But um, it cost us quite significantly, especially because our, our third child is adopted from Ethiopia. So there was a lot of racism that was sort of unleashed at us because when we spoke out, they said it was, but, you know, even, you know, the past week, someone said, oh, you need some more retail therapy. Go buy another kid. You know, it was Ugh. just so awful. And so we were, so the criticisms against us were racialized and, and sexualized. Mm -hmm. So if I made my political opinion known, they would mock me sexually or put pornographic videos of me out there. And if I said a different political opinion, they would put pictures of my daughter on the Internet being like put in Auschwitz with Donald Trump pulling the gas lever. I mean, like stuff that you just would not believe it was it was treacherous. And I don't think people could possibly understand it. Just, you know, just being a casual observer of it. But the stuff that we received was it. it would It's terrifying. And yeah, so why keep speaking out? I mean, you and David both are like doubling down. Um, and I am a regular reader. I've obviously read your book. I read his column regularly. So I'm really grateful for, as a recipient of your work. But in terms of, yeah, I mean, the cost has been really great. You know, I'm, I don't know that I'm speaking. I, I'm trying to even decide if I am speaking out anymore. I sort of got sick of everything and sort mm. of retreated. And I, instead of engaging in politics, I decided to do the Canacock investigation, which took me forever. And then I got demoralized. Um, and then I sort of started thinking about becoming a storyteller. So I was able to do some moth appearances, which was so fun and mm -hmm. not related to politics at all. So I'm, I'm, so I'm sort of, I feel like I've taken a step back and, okay. and David has taken a step forward, obviously as a writer for the New York times. Um, I mean, I promote all of his stuff and I occasionally get a little snarky on social media. Um, but I just, I don't know. I just feel like this stuff is important. Like if, if you cannot speak out against rapist and racist, I mean, I, I just, this, yeah. it's not, it's, it's not marginal. It's not like. Oh, he has a different opinion on what the tax rate should be. Right. Which I don't care about. Right. Yeah. Um, but there's such great evil. And so it just feels at some point you just have to. Anyway, I'm trying to I'm not actively engaging politically right now. And I've, I've sort of stopped ghostwriting for obvious reasons. But um, I and the obvious reasons are I was unemployable. I don't have a tribe. I don't have a tribe. There's nobody like me that wants me to write for them. Because when you hire a ghostwriter, you don't hire them to write their opinions. You hire them to write your opinions. Right. And so I'm, so anyway, so I'm, I'm sort of like, I'm not sure how much speaking out I'm doing. I am speaking out a, a great deal against, um, you know, sex abuse and stuff like that, which you would think would not code red or blue, but it does. So anytime I speak out against sex abuse, people are like, oh, well, you're just a liberal. And it's like, okay, I can't. Right. I can't even defend this. Right. Right. Um, well, so I'm, I mentioned as we, uh, before we even got on here that I've just relatively recently renamed this podcast, Reimagining the Good Life. And I'm thinking about a lot of the things that you've had to reimagine or rethink at least in these past 10 years. Um, and I'm curious, like whether that has, there's obviously been just deep, sorrow and betrayal in your story has there been 
anything that has actually been hopeful or can you imagine, like, has your imagination been shaped in any way that actually brings you hope and like a sense of, of possibility without like kind of toxic positivity? Like I'm not looking for a happy, cheery answer if there's not one. Yes. I, when I wrote that 2016 Washington Post piece and everybody lost their collective marbles over it, I just decided to start following anyone who was kind to me on social media because Mm -hmm. previously I would follow just people of my tribe. Hmm. And then I realized I had no tribe. So all these people started offering kind words and they mostly were Democrats. Hmm. And so I would just like, 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 follow, follow, follow. And I followed this one person named Kathy Kattenberg Hmm. on Twitter and Kathy um, she had, I didn't even know if she was a real person. She had a, I stand with immigrants icon in her thing. And so she was really nice to me. She said something nice. I followed her, but for the next year, every time I logged on, Kathy Kattenberg was absolutely eviscerating my husband. Oh. <laughs> she, she hated him because she thought he, she didn't, he didn't understand anti-Semitism. He's pro-life. She's had four abortions, which she talks about a lot. Um, I mean, racism, she would mock him for celebrating death. I mean, it's just weird, like very significantly uncharitable, but she was nice to me. So like, whatever. (laughs) So I I was always friends with her or I noticed, I just, but I mean, I, I noticed that she criticized him. And then I have this rule, even though I don't feel like my faith is incredibly robust. I made a rule about 10 years ago that if I ever saw anyone who was in need that I would try to help. Hmm. And one day, Kathy Kattenberg tweeted that she was food insecure during COVID. Hmm. And so I reached out to her and I was like, Kathy, uh, are you food insecure? I saw that you're, you know, that you mentioned something on Twitter. And she was like, yes, I'm going to call you. So she, so I talked to her on the phone, which is like, for, for me, that's like my Waterloo. I never want to talk on the phone. Um, but especially talk on the phone with someone who hates us. Right. <laughs> and so I, but I talked to her and she was like, yes, I, I'm disabled and I can't leave the house. And I've only had pancake mix for two and a half weeks. And I was like, oh my gosh, okay, we're going to do this. So like I called all the synagogues, I called PCA churches because that's what she is and that's what I am. And we couldn't find any food, Hmm. but every day Kathy Kattenberg and I talked on the phone and eventually she was like, why are you doing this? I have been so mean to your family. Hmm. And I was like, I don't know, Kathy, Jesus, it's just this thing, whatever. And she was like, well, how are we going to get the food? So this, by this time it took, it took us like five days. And I was like, I don't know. I think we just need to pray. And she was like, okay, pray. And I was like, I don't pray. I don't know. I pray out loud with you on the phone. I don't know how Jews pray. I don't want to accidentally like offend you. And she was like, just pray good heaven. So <laughs> Kathy Kattenberg, this liberal lady troll on Twitter and I were praying for food deliveries. And that afternoon, three food deliveries came. So I'd ordered like from Amazon and Whole Foods and all these. And she had like 25 bananas and like 10 pounds of meat, you know, just crazy. But Kathy and I love each other so much. We, this is like three years later. She is so smart. She is so wonderful. She is so caring. Um, And when I do, and I even went to New York and did a moth storytelling thing and I invited her to go and we had a car get her. And then David, her former frenemy escorted her from the car into Lincoln Center so she could hear. It was hmm. so sweet. And we got to visit with her. But she's so I think that's just so sweet. Yeah. That something like I never in a million years would have reached out to Kathy, except that she had reached out to me. And my whole imagination has been broadened because I just realized that I always in my life was trying to say, okay, here are the good people and here are the bad people. And the good people look like this and the bad people look like this and the good people vote like this and the bad people vote like this. And the good people go to these types of churches and the bad people, they don't go to church at all. Mm. And I'm just like completely sorry. I was wrong about so much stuff. And I love, love to have these interesting uh, dialogues with people and you just meet you know, one of the things that I've noticed through the Kathy thing is that so many people are acrimonious because they're alone, mm. you know? And so just reaching out to people and having community is like, a re- love is powerful. You know, there should be a book about that. <laughs> one of the things that I loved about your whole book is your humility. Just that, um, I mean, as anyone who's listened to this conversation can tell, there is like a fierce wit and you're not going to hold back from speaking the truth. And there's like a huge strength to all of that. And yet um, that sense of 
uh, yeah, I was wrong. I was a part of the problem. And I have not like solved it all, but I'm also going to like, and being honest about that in and of itself uh, is such a, I think, um, I don't know, a step towards healing um, and towards a reimagined future, you know, and whether that is just for you and Kathy Kattenberg, and quite frankly, anyone who just listened to you tell that story um, has had their imagination shaped in terms of what would, what is, if it is possible for the two of you to become dear friends, not just for her to be nice to you once and then for you to help her with some food, but for you to actually become dear friends, like that um, to me speaks of just so much that is actually possible if we allow ourselves to like encounter each other as humans. Yes. And I, the the woman is lovely. Like she's so delightful. I love her so much. But additionally, you know, like when you expand your imagination and you get to connect with people in these ways, it, it, it change, it makes you less anxious hmm. because you're not looking for safety. You're just looking for connection. Hmm. And it's just so beautiful. I'm so, this is what I've done my whole life. I have been I've looked at people and demanded that churches be theologically orthodox when they're behaviorally heretical. Mm -hmm. So they might line up like, okay, they believe this about baptism or they believe this about salvation, but the fruits of the spirit, non-freaking existent. Yeah. So I, I just, I just don't, I, I don't know anything about theology. I'm a three-time college dropout. I don't know. I don't, I, I read the Bible, I think four times. <laughs> Uh, at almost not. 50. So that's, that's pretty good. Yeah. I mean, basically I'm, I'm just declaring my holiness. Um, <laughs> but I don't really quite understand theology and I'm also so uninterested in it, especially because the people who are always talking about it are so mean. And so I'm just like, okay, give me, the Bible says you'll know the tree by its fruit. Give me some of that fruit Yeah, and back off. You know, that's how I feel about it. And there is just this, um, I mean, one of the lines in the book is just about truth being complicated, like that there was this, you know, long stretch where either you believed or at least wanted to believe that truth was not complicated at all. Um, right. and, and there is, as you said, like there are some real moral lines in the sand that are not complicated. But then what's complicated is the humans who live that truth, right? Like the, the that these people who believe different things, or as you said, um, theologically are uh, orthodox, but behaviorally are heretics. And then you have the opposite too, where it's like, you are theologically a heretic, but you're living in the way of Jesus. You might not even right. call on Jesus and you're living in the way of Jesus. And, um, and honestly, when I look back to Jesus's uh, own ministry, he seemed to be, um, doing a lot of that complicating work too, in terms of saying like, yeah, you got your theology all right and you're living all wrong. And so we right. at, at the very least need to ask some questions here. Um, but yeah, let's, let's imagine a new, a new way of being together. Um, well, I am really grateful for the work you've done to, I think, name some important and hard truths um, and to have humility while doing that. But also there is, I don't know, for me, this conversation is a hopeful one in terms of um, both yours and David's, um, your family's willingness, again, not just to, whether it's write this book or write his column, but also to be like hanging out with Kathy Kattenberg, right? I mean, that that all to me is <laughs> is an encouraging um, and hopeful uh, indication that maybe we could, yeah, be more human together in the future. Yes. And I think one of the things that I hope people can sort of sort of situate themselves in right now is that if you feel politically, geographically, or spiritually homeless, it's a good place to be. Mm. That discomfort is good. Um, Jesus didn't have a place to lay his head. I'm not comparing myself to Jesus at all. But it's, it's, not, it's not a completely foreign idea that Christians are in exile in their communities. Mm -hmm. And I think if you can sort of situate yourself into that discomfort, there's real beauty to be observed. Mm. Well, I think we should end on that note. Um, and thank you again, just for giving us your time and um, experience and wisdom. Um, yeah. And that good word. 
Oh, thank you so much. It's so good to see you. 10 years. We'll meet 10 years from now again. <laughs> <laughs> Try to make it sooner. <laughs> okay. Sounds good.